All right, well, welcome to the show. Dr. Oz says the biggest Philadelphia newspaper is trying to cancel him in his run for the U.S. Senate by refusing to refer to him as Dr. Oz. I'll tell you what's really going on later in the show with the good doctor. But first, former President Donald Trump and former Fox News anchor Bill O'Reilly hit the road last weekend for the first two stops on what they're calling the History Tour. The program features O'Reilly interviewing the 45th president in a conversation about his time in office. Many detractors, though, of the former president have been highlighting how empty the arenas have appeared in photos thus far. For the two stops in Florida this past Saturday and Sunday. Reports from the arenas noted that there had been thousands of empty seats, large sections of curtained off. Uh, the Sun Sentinel reported that $100 tickets were being slashed to 40 ahead of the showtime, and fans in upper levels got, quote, upgrades. I'm guessing the host is going to dispute much of this. Joining us now is Bill O'Reilly. Bill, thanks so much for coming on the show. Appreciate it. All right, so what say you? Abrams, thanks for having me. What say me? It's a bunch of lies. I mean, the doctored photos that you saw uh, were taken before most of the people were allowed into the arena. I mean, look, here's how ridiculous this whole thing is. So the Sun Sentinel sent a reporter to uh, the arena where the Florida Panthers play. The reporter didn't call me. I am producing the show. It's my production company. She could have easily had the attendance and the gross. The gross of that show was $2 million, about 11000 in the building. So many people, Abrams, that the Secret Service had to delay the show an hour because they couldn't get people through the doors. There were so many of them. Wait, wait, now, Phil, how could it, wait, why, wait, wait, how why, could it have taken Secret Service extra time to fill up an arena, right? If it's an arena that seats, I think it's up to 18,000 at that they arena. Had, and you, they had to do security is, is, on everybody. Yeah, and they were, they were overwhelmed by how the people came. And so there so, was a line sneaking out and the reporter was actually there okay. and saw it. But here's the bottom line on the show. $2 million gross on one show. What politician in the world could do that? Could Barack Obama do that? Only if he was playing keyboards for the Stones. No politician well, on earth could do a show that grosses $2 million. And that was the story that these people who hate Trump, and they do, would not report. So, so all of the reports we're getting about people being upgraded seats, slashing prices before the thing Bull. starts, the, uh, the, total, the Daytona total Beach Bull. News nope. and Journal reports, the Republicans in Volusia were handing out free tickets, all, all untrue. <laughs> Ridiculous. Absurd. The four shows, two in Florida and two in Texas, have so far grossed $7 million plus, okay? Nobody could possibly do this. We didn't slash any prices for anybody. It's line of sight because you have a small stage with President Trump and me on it. If you can't see the stage, we don't sell those seats. Everybody so, knows that. So did Go you? Ahead. But it did, you didn't sell out. Fraud. It's fair. They it's, hate Trump. It's fair to say you didn't to make Trump look bad. But it's fair to say but, you didn't sell out. We didn't sell out what? It was impossible to sell it out because of the way the arena was configured. So if you have an 18,000 seat arena, but 6,000 of those seats are out of the line of sight, you can't sell them. It's a big con. The gross is what, is what matters on these shows. And nobody's going to grow seven million plus on four shows. No politician in the world. Why isn't that story being written? Let's move from the ben, size of the crowd. Why isn't well, that look, being you, written? You, you, you've just told the story. Well, because I would guess that Barack Obama, for example, you mentioned him, wasn't going out and trying to make money on interviews, right? That he was basically doing this interview with Michelle Obama. They had to add more times to the, uh, to the uh, events. They had the same thing with Bill and Hillary Clinton. My, <clears throat> excuse me. My guess is they weren't trying to make money. Oh, stop. Yeah, I mean, 
Okay. I don't know. So you like, asked. That's my guess. The Obamas <clears> and the, <throat> the Clinton tour they had to, they couldn't do it. Mm -hmm. I mean, they just couldn't do it financially. This is a history tour. I put this together. I had to convince Donald Trump to do <clears> it. <throat> you can come to me. And I wanted to get on the record certain things that I didn't know because they weren't reported that happened during his administration. And the headline that we got in Florida was that on January 5th, and this is very important for News Nation viewers, on January 5th, President Trump called the Pentagon, Christopher Miller, the acting defense chief, and asked for the National Guard to be deployed in front of the Capitol and other government buildings because he believed there was going to be so many people on the 6th. Now, that was not done, all right? But that takes away the House committee's allegation that Trump instigated the riot at the Capitol. So that's well, a big headline. He's, I didn't right, know that. that, 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 that he I, stated I know that it, either. And, and we have it on the I, record. I didn't know that either, but he did show up then on the 6th and still made the speech that he made, right? Yes, he made a speech. Right. Right. But it wasn't did, he did while he was making the speech, he didn't know what was happening. Now, I'm going to ask him in Texas because we're going to be in Houston on Saturday and Dallas on Sunday. I'm going to ask him more thoroughly. Were you too late in your condemnation of the riot? And we're going to discuss that. And, you know, Donald Trump doesn't ask for questions in advance. He doesn't do that. He gets up there. He takes the fire. This isn't a cupcake interview. If you watch the transcript, you'll know I asked the toughest questions I could, and we got a lot of stuff on the record. Well, that's what I want to ask about. I want to ask about the substance of, of some of what you've been talking about with the former president. Here's a clip of one part of your conversation where the former president talks about the prospect of running in 2024. We won the first time, and the second time we won by even more, and it looks like we might have to think about very strongly a third time. So does the, the host of uh, the No Spin News, does he tell the former president to stop with the nonsense about having won in 2020? He asked me my opinion, and I told him that was a loser. And I told him he should run on his record if he wants to go for another term. It's exactly what I told him. He asked me, and it's exactly what I told him. Do you challenge him, though, when he says this again and again? Do you say, come on, stop? Stop or he's say, what to, is the evidence? I don't waste time on that. He's entitled to his opinion. I don't want to waste the two hours I have with him on that. If I say, well, where's your evidence? He's going to come up with 15 things I can't possibly verify. <laughs> so well, he's entitled to his opinion. He doesn't believe that the uh, election was honest. Obviously, history will go against him. This is right. the history tour. <laughs> and I'm advancing the narrative. And the narrative is he's definitely going to run again unless there's an unforeseen circumstance. That's what the January 6th House Committee is all about. They want to take him off the board so he can't run again. That's what this is all about in the House. But a again, I would just think that knowing he's going to run again, right, knowing that he's continuing on right. these stages again and again, it's not an opinion. He's making this stuff up about 2020. You know that. You've, you've said it yourself. Look, you know he's making this stuff up it's at not this my point. Job. So why not just say to him, you know, we, look, to, 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 you're, you're, you're there. You said you're asking him the tough questions. That's the tough question to ask, no? No, because it goes nowhere. It goes nowhere. He's not going to change his opinion. He thinks that the election was unfair. Okay. History says it wasn't. Okay. Let's move forward. That's my job. Why do I want to relitigate an election for two hours when people are paying good money, all right, to hear <laughs> all right. what is going so to happen let, down the road? Why, why do I want to let's do that? Agree. That's a waste of let's time. Let's agree. Right. Let's agree. It would be a bad show for the people who are there if you keep following up on that issue. Fair? It's a bad show for anybody. It's just a <laughs> merry-go-round that you can't get off. All right? He sees it that way. History sees it this way. Yeah. All right. He knows All right. the history books are not going to reflect 
any kind of opinion that he has that it was rigged. He knows that. So let's go move it forward, right? Well, except that he, he's running again, as you said, and, you know, there are things to be well, concerned don't vote about. For him. No, no, but that's not about don't voting. Vote I'm for saying, him. putting aside, no, I'm saying people who support him, uh, people who support his policies may still be concerned about 2024 in terms of him claiming again, whether he wins or he loses, some dangerous stuff. Hey, that's I mean, their, look, Dan, come on, listen to yourself. If they want to be concerned about the last election, they have a right to be concerned about whatever they want. The reality is if Donald Trump runs, he's going to have to run against the Democrat. OK, and I'll, I'll give your audience this. Hillary Clinton wants the nomination. She knows the Biden administration is falling apart, which is why you're seeing her surface right now. So it could be a replay. Yeah. But. Well, voters make up their own mind and everybody knows now. And I when Donald Trump asks me, I don't volunteer advice to any president. But they ask me and they all have since Bill Clinton, my opinion on certain things. I told President Trump, run on your record. That's where your strength me, is. That's it. Let me play one more piece of sound. Um, this is where uh, President Trump was talking about uh, various relationships with some, uh, some world leaders that he had to, uh, to deal with. Let's play it. I got along great with Putin. I got along great with President Xi of China. I got along great with Kim Jong-un of North Korea. And isn't that good? Isn't that better than having a nuclear war? I did, I got along great with him. I liked him, he liked me, he wrote me beautiful letters. He wrote me beautiful letters. I called them love letters. And the press said, he's saying he wrote letters. And they are. They are love letters. I'm sitting here trying to imagine Bill O'Reilly doing an interview with, I don't know, Obama, Hillary Clinton, saying, and they're talking about getting love letters um, from, you know, a dictator in North Korea or whoever it is. O'Reilly's going to follow up on that and say, wait a sec, love letters? O'Reilly already did. You'll remember the first interview Donald Trump did after he was inaugurated. I told Donald Trump that Putin was a killer. And what are you going to do about him? You'll remember, that's a famous soundbite. And he said, well, we're not so pure ourselves here. So Trump's answer is reflective of Trump's way of governing. He's a deal maker and he'll make a deal with the devil if he believes the deal is good for the USA. And his posture is, it was better to have Xi and Putin and little rocket man not be belligerent. And if you look back, we didn't have Chinese planes flying over Taiwan or Russian troops massed on the Ukrainian border under Trump. That did not happen. And that's what his thrust is. You may not like them, but I dealt with them in an effective way. Again, this is the well, history tour. Yeah. It's not right, trying no, and, to but, cut well, like Kim, Kim Jong -un, legs out from under him. Right, but Kim, as you know, Kim Jong-un continued to build nuclear weapons, continued to pursue to testing, et cetera, despite the fact that he was saying- He didn't cause a lot of trouble under the Trump administration. He, he fired he, a couple of rockets in the ocean. Oh yeah, just but he didn't couple cause of a lot rockets. of trouble. Little, little rockets. In the they were just, they were, come on, yeah, in the come ocean. on, come on. All right, Look, Bill, hang on, stick around. an unstable I'll, dictator. Bill, let, let me take a quick break. Coming right back with Bill O'Reilly. Sure. With more in a moment. We're back with Bill O'Reilly, talking about his history tour with former President Trump and some other issues. Um, Bill, let me ask you about something in the news. Uh, what do you make of the text between the Fox News hosts um, and Mark Meadows? that occurred on January 6th, where a lot of them were sort of imploring uh, him to do something uh, to get the president out there, to get him in the Oval Office, whatever the case may be. And then, as you know, the critics then say, well, they were they were begging him to do something on that day, January 6th. And then shortly thereafter, they're out there suggesting this was no big deal. What do you make of it? Well, I don't know about the no big deal part. Um, I didn't see that. Uh, maybe it happened, but I don't know. 
So uh, a number of Fox News hosts had Mark Meadows, who was the chief of staff to Trump, his direct email. And that's not a bad thing. If you're a journalist, as you know, Dan, uh, you want to have access to the most powerful people you can. And if they are nice enough to give you their email, I, that's a good thing. So when all hell broke loose in the Capitol, um, they apparently, some Fox News people, and I assume other people as well, um, were emailing Mr. Meadows saying, hey, what are you guys going to do? When are you going to do it? You got to get out there. This is a debacle. This is crazy. So it seems to me, I don't know whether it's over the journalistic line. I wouldn't have done it myself. I would have asked the question, say, are you guys going to make a statement? What are you going to do? Uh, looks like things are out of control. I don't think I would have advocated. That's not what journalists do. Um, but it, it was in a very intense, quick-breaking situation. So I'm not going to condemn anybody here. Um, I, I think that if you want the best for your country, everybody would agree you wanted the president to make a statement that they should stop, right? And again, that's what I'm going to talk to Donald Trump about in Houston and Dallas this coming weekend. Were you quick enough to come out and ask these people to cease and desist? If you had to do it over again, would you change the way you did it? Those questions will be asked. But I, I, am, I guess I'm a little surprised that you, you believe that some of those texts cross the journalistic line, right? They may have. I'd have to see them in the context of what the discussion was on the email. Look, we, we live in a country now where the stuff hits the Internet. Nobody knows the context. You're a fair man. That's why I'm doing this program. I've known you a long time. And by the way, I want to tell your audience that this is the most fun Dan Abrams has had in months interviewing me tonight. <laughs> and that's absolutely a fact. You can see it. Yeah, that's, but that's a pretty I, sad I state of Dan Abrams' life, if that's the point, if that's true. Well, I, go. <laughs> I just want to, be tr I want to be truthful. I'd have to yep. see the context of what it was. So I know all these people. I know Hannity. I know Ingram. I know right. Kilmeade. They want what's best for the country. Okay, that's what they want. They may not, you may not agree with the way they do it, you may not like that they like Trump or whatever it may be, but I didn't see anything subversive there. Did you? What, what, do, you make of, what do you make of Fox News primetime? Well, wait, 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 wait. Did you see anything subversive in what Hannity no, I and Ingram think, look, and, and I, I have to tell did? You, I, I, I'll tell you, Bill. Sorry, someone was in my ear when you asked the question. I, I, I don't actually have a problem with the Fox News hosts having reached out demanding the president do something. I have a much bigger yeah, problem I, with them then like going on the air me. and trying to minimize it. That's my problem, meaning, hey, well, well, good well, for you. You'd have to show me that soundbite. It. You'd have to show me that you'd have to show me that soundbite before I'm going to say on they minimize watch, anything. Hey, you, you can watch Fox News almost any night in prime time, and you will hear them in some way, shape or form either bashing the January 6th commission, which I Hannity think is a fair, that. the January 6th commission? I never heard Hannity do that. I, yeah. No, well, I never heard I, Hannity um, I, I, you, diminish it's, it's a fair question as to whether Hannity, of, of the, but, but I will tell you that again and again, and it's true that Hannity has been much better about this than, for example, Tucker, um, Laura Ingram, and some others when it comes to January 6th. It's a fair defense of Hannity there. But my problem is less with the comments themselves and more with the comments later. You know, for example, what did you make of Tucker Carlson and his comments in his documentary about January 6th? I'm not going to I'm not going to I'm not going to comment on that. I didn't see the documentary. I think that the Capitol riot was one of the most disgraceful displays in U.S. history. And everybody involved in that riot should pay a price. And I've said that from day one. Now, if people disagree, they have a right to disagree. But that's my posture. And uh, I'll tell you, Fox News is a different place than it was when I was there. All right. Uh, I don't know. I don't follow it that that uh, closely anymore. Uh, but when I was there, there was a discipline from management that diminishing the Capitol riot could never have happened. And I'll, I'll state that firmly on the record. That's look, I think it's important. And I think you're right, by the way. I think it's a different place than it was uh, some years back. What did you make of Chris Wallace's departure? 
Big deal? It was abrupt. It was abrupt. Um, so I, I think that uh, the Fox management was caught by surprise. Um, I think that Wallace got a good deal from CNN. He's in his mid-70s now. He might want to cut back a little. Um, I think you'll see Wallace on CNN prime time as a commentator. Uh, I think that CNN is trying to rebrand now because it's almost off the cliff. That's how bad CNN's ratings are and its images. So they bring in Wallace. It helps them. I think they might want to bring in uh, uh, Brian Williams. Uh, I wouldn't be surprised if he shows up over there because uh, AT&T, which owns CNN, is uh, they're crazed. They are absolutely crazed about what's happened to that network because it's not a news network anymore. I mean, you can criticize Fox News all day long, but CNN not only doesn't get any ratings, mm -hmm. but you absolutely know the corruption that's gone on there. And it's just hard to believe. Did you know, Fox Abrams? That on Friday, and I saw your show, and you covered the Jesse Smollett case. You covered the verdict, correct? Yeah, I did. You did. MSNBC yeah. did not mention it from seven oh. to midnight. Believe didn't me, you, you, I, I appreciate you watching the show because, as you know, I beat up on MSNBC. I will beat up on CNN as it, appropriate. In fact, it is a segment it, coming up later in the show where I'm going to be beaten up. Uh, doing doing some some beaten up. But I want to ask you one more question about Fox, and that is sure. whether the O'Reilly factor in the form that you had it could exist at Fox News today. Well, sure, because I brought in millions and millions of viewers and billions of dollars to that corporation for more than 20 years. Look, there'll never be another cable news anchor who's number one for 16 consecutive years. It's a different world now. It's everything is fractured now. But if I went back to any network and reimposed the O'Reilly factor where we brought on people to debate from all sides and we presented uh, as evidence as best we could backed up by facts, I, that show would go through the roof. But it's <laughs> easy to play to the choir. And that's what they're all doing now. That's easy. It's yeah. hard to debate, I, and especially when you bring bright I, people in. Go ahead. I agree. You, you know, you're right. It may, you, have to, you have to prepare. You have to think about it um, before the interview. Yeah. And I will say, and again, Research. I agree with you, for example, on MSNBC, you don't see any of that. Certainly, and on Fox in prime time, you see almost no, no, none they, of it. They said, OK, and here's our next guest who agrees with me entirely. And here's our right. next guest who agrees with me 95 percent of the time. Right. I think right. it's boring myself. <laughs> I couldn't possibly do a show like that. I want to hear the other side. That's right. what makes it fun. This is why this has been fun. Bill O'Reilly, I appreciate the time. Thank you for coming on. All right, Dan, good to see you, man. Coming up, Dr. Oz trading his scrubs and daytime TV show in the hopes of becoming a U.S. senator state's largest newspaper refusing to call him doctor. Mr. Oz just doesn't have the same ring, does it? But there's a reason. Coming up next. All right, before I get to my media moments, I will just tell you that Sean Hannity just texted me. He's been watching the interview I just did with Bill O'Reilly, and uh, he's bothered by the fact that I was saying that he was minimizing January 6th. He sent me a long quote about what he said on his radio show on January 6th. Um, he's going to air it, he says again tonight. Sean, I'm going to look up to find, see if there's anything else out there. But I did back off when it came to the question of exactly what you said, as opposed to Tucker and, uh, and some of the others. But I'm on you now, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to look and see if, uh, if it's all consistent. Time now for Mediate Moments. We check in on the day's bias, buzz, and bull in the world of cable news and beyond. As you may have heard, TV host Dr. Oz wants to become Pennsylvania Senator Oz, or is it Senator Dr. Oz? That's a question we're going to tackle in a minute. But he's learning the hard way that politics can be uglier than hosting a daytime talk show. And his campaign comes with some baggage, carpet baggage. A longtime New Jersey resident running for the open Senate seat in Pennsylvania. Apparently, he began voting in the state's elections last year by absentee ballot, having registered at his in-laws address in suburban Philadelphia. But Dr. Oz's residence isn't the only controversy surrounding his campaign. The Philadelphia Inquirer recently announced that they don't want to call him Dr. Oz anymore, and they want to refer to him by his official name, Mehmet Oz. 
The day after announcing Dr. Oz's candidacy in a blaring front page headline, editors at the Inquirer decided that, quote, Dr. Oz was really just a celebrity brand. And of course, the good doctor tried to use this as an opportunity to claim he was being targeted by the media. Our campaign is gaining momentum. So the liberal media wants to cancel me. The Philadelphia Inquirer stopped calling me doctor, even though I'm a practicing physician who's performed thousands of heart surgeries. Yeah, except that two of the other candidates running are also medical doctors and are also going to be treated the same way, losing the medical honorific, which seemed to be confusing even to a generally sympathetic Fox News. After the Inquirer ran doctor in its headline, the paper's style committee determined that doing so was the wrong call. Going forward, the Inquirer determined that it will refer to all candidates in the same way, which means that doc while Oz may be referenced as a celebrity doctor, Dr. Oz will be limited to mentions of his TV show, which is now off the air in Philly. All right, it gets strange. CNN's Michael Smirconish tells the story of running into Dr. Oz at a party. I said to him, look, I'd really like to get you on my program and I will treat you. You know what is what is my line? I'll treat you with dignity and respect. I will treat you with dignity and respect. And he proceeds to say to me, I can't possibly do that. Because it would upset everybody at Fox. So is it Dr. Oz who's canceling CNN or the other way around? But regardless, it is probably a smart move by the good doctor. I mean, why give up the built-in support? Is the media mob trying to cancel Dr. Oz? I mean, literally cancel Dr. Oz. Yeah. He wants us to know that he will not be canceled by Dr. Fauci or anybody else. Well, they're trying to cancel you. I saw your Twitter. That's what you said. Hannity's watching. So Hannity, they're not trying to cancel Dr. Oz. They're just taking out the doctor names out of everyone who's a doctor who's running. It's our wrap up of the day's media bias, Buzz and the Bull. Coming up, speaking of media, CNN Plus. Making a lot of noise, hiring Chris Wallace from Fox. Is anyone going to ever watch a second CNN? There, there are very few people watching the first one. What's next? Attempted a subscription streaming service set to debut in the spring of next year. It's gonna be heavily promoted have a number of notable journalists for now headlined by Wallace. But who is the audience for CNN Plus? Ratings on the flagship CNN are down a whopping 47% through the first three quarters of 2021. Now almost every major news outlet has experienced declines this year, which is natural considering 2020 was a presidential election year. But even in the current landscape, it's a dramatic decline. And recently they've had some of their lowest ratings in years. And so CNN is going to try and sell a paid product to an audience that's hardly even watched it for free as part of their cable packages. Like most broadcast entities, CNN sees streaming as the future, and they want to plant their flag. Despite having already had a couple of costly flops, like, for instance, a failed app it bought from YouTube influencer Casey Neistat for $25 million. Now many of CNN's rivals are already in the streaming game. Fox News has actually had some success with their streaming platform, Fox Nation. But that features the show Cops and the network's personalities hosting documentaries and other shows that you might not ordinarily find on the network. NBC's Peacock is part of its offering, some of the same types of shows you'd find on MSNBC. Some are even more liberal than on MSNBC. I know. But that's in addition to a myriad of entertainment offerings. So it's not like a standalone news thing, which is why I'm struggling to figure out why CNN is spending such big bucks on people like Chris Wallace and others. How can a second paid CNN product possibly work? Aren't they just throwing away money? Maybe they're doing it to promote themselves so people like me will discuss it. Joining me now, once again, is the respected media critic, Eric Deggins, TV critic for NPR. All right, Eric, I'm going to ask you the same question I asked you on the last topic we talked about. What am I getting wrong here? Uh, a few things. Number one, uh, we don't know what the programming is going to be on CNN Plus, and some of CNN's most successful programming is non-news programming. It's it's Lisa Ling, it's Anthony Bourdain, it's uh, the documentaries that they've done on the history of late-night television and the history of sitcoms. 
And I'm assuming that CNN Plus very well, very well might feature that kind of material. Secondly, you said that they would be trying to sell the service to the audience that's not watching them. That's not the point. <laughs> the point of these uh, online platforms is to reach the people who don't watch cable TV news yeah. regularly. And in fact, you know, Fox News has an advantage because it, it appeals to traditional cable TV news subscribers, right? And it, and it, uh, it has developed a sort of a, a cultish following of people uh, who will support them uh, regardless of what they do. And CNN's been in a tough spot because their viewership goes up and down with interest in the news cycle, as you noted. Um, you know, every cable news outlet has lost uh, viewership year to year because there was so much interest in the presidential election and in uh, the coronavirus before we had a vaccine. Uh, but uh, CNN has seen the steepest ratings losses of any of the big three uh, cable news outlets. Yeah, look, I, I hear you and I think you're right. If CNN decides to get out of the news business on CNN Plus and start doing the documentaries, I think you're right, that it could do quite well um, as something else. But if they're hiring Chris Wallace and Casey Hunt from MSNBC Casey, yeah. and maybe Brian Williams and all these other people, they're not gonna be hosting documentaries on the history of the 90s. They're gonna be doing news and, and I can tell you that I don't think it's going to work if that's what they do, but we shall see what they do. They, Erica, they thank hiring, you very much. They are hiring over yeah, 400 people. Yeah, they're hiring people, a ton. And they have an international brand. They have an international brand. Well, this is going that, to reach out great. To, uh, beyond uh, the United States. So I think we have to well, wait and see what they have planned. Yeah, and look, and, and maybe internationally it'll be able to do something, but hey, the fact that they're hiring a lot of people and throwing around a lot of money doesn't necessarily mean that it's going to work, as we've seen from some of their other streaming efforts. But uh, Erica, we look forward to talking to you about another topic tomorrow. Thank you for coming on the show. Appreciate it. Coming up, punishing parents for their son's potential crime. Mom and dad back before a judge facing charges after their son accused of shooting and killing four of his, his classmates. But charging mom and dad could set a dangerous precedent and no one is talking about it. Up next. Parents of Ethan Crumbly, the 15-year-old suspect in the November 30th Oxford, Michigan school shooting that killed four students and injured seven, were in court today. James and Jennifer Crumbly facing multiple involuntary manslaughter charges. The Crumblies made their first court appearance since entering not guilty pleas during their arraignment. They appeared before a judge for a probable cause conference in Rochester Hills District Court. Prosecutors said that more time was needed because the case is unprecedented in the state. Oakland County Prosecutor Karen McDonald Putting out this statement, based on the evidence we have reviewed to this point, our focus remains on the defendants in custody and their role in these unspeakable murders. We've met with school officials, and they're cooperating with the investigation and our prosecution of the defendants. All three Crumblies are currently being held separately at Oxford County Jail. The major question for me is not were James and Jennifer Crumbly's actions morally wrong as parents. Of course they were. But should they also be considered serious crimes? Now, to understand this, you need to break down the timeline of events leading up to the shooting on November 26th. Black Friday, James Crumbly purchased the semi-automatic handgun used during the shooting. Ethan was with him. Ethan would later post an image with the gun on his social media. That is a bad fact for the parents. The next day, Jennifer Crumbly posted on social media that it was bought for her son as an early Christmas present. That, too, not helpful. One day before the shooting, a teacher caught Ethan Crumbly searching for ammunition on his phone, Crumbly parents were notified and Jennifer Crumbly texted her son, quote, LOL, I'm not mad at you. You have to learn not to get caught. And then the day of the attack, a teacher found a disturbing drawing from Ethan. The note contained a picture of a handgun pointed at people in another section, a picture of someone shot and bleeding, and also the quote, my life is useless. Both parents were called to the school, shown the drawings, but according to prosecutors, they never searched their son's backpack or told the school their son had access to a gun. They were adamant that Ethan be allowed to stay at school, which he later would be. Once the news of the shooting broke, Jennifer Crumbly texted her son, quote, Ethan, don't do it. And James Crumbly called 911 saying a gun was missing from his house and that his son might be the shooter. Days after the shooting, the prosecutor explained why she believes the Crumbly parents broke the law. I have tremendous compassion and empathy for parents who have children who are struggling and at risk for whatever reason. And I am by no means saying that an active shooter situation should always result in a criminal prosecution against parents. 
But the facts of this case are so egregious. Reading this document, looking at it, reading the words, help me, with a gun, blood everywhere. This doesn't just have impact me as a prosecutor and a lawyer. It impacts me as a mother. But prosecutors aren't supposed to make decisions based on being a parent. Joining me now, attorney Terry Hostin, co-host of the nationally syndicated program, The Law and Crime Daily. Terry, do you, are you concerned at all about the precedent that this sets? Not at all. I think she made the right decision. If you cannot choose to select these parents to be culpable for criminal negligence, involuntary manslaughter, then there will never be such a case. The facts, and she laid those facts out in this case really do show that they're responsible. They bought the gun. They did not heed the warnings of the school. They didn't take him out. They didn't get him any sort of mental help. And I think as a parent to a 15 year old, you have to be responsible for the actions of your children when they are so extreme and when you ignore it to such the an extent. The problem is where the line is drawn, right? That's my concern is that Prosecutors are going to start getting more aggressive and more aggressive. And look, civilly, they're always responsible, Absolutely. right? Your kids do something, you get sued for it, it happens all the time. And, and by the way, in certain cases where a three-year-old, let's say, shoots another kid and the gun was available, that's a manslaughter charge. But in a case like this, the, the idea that it was sort of foreseeable on the part of the parents, they, that it should have been foreseeable, they're called in that morning to the school. Now, I get it. The timing is awful. And I'm not celebrating them in any way, shape, or form as parents. They were bad parents, but criminal charges. You know what, Dan? I even think they might have known what was going to happen, and I think this case really? is different from other All cases. Right, if that's the case, then you I'd agree with you. About it. The if they can show that, then I'd agree with you. The fact that she said, LOL, just don't get caught. The fact that she said, don't do it, she knew something was going on, and I think they could have stopped it. So I, that yeah. is I think that's a big, I, I don't think that's going to be shown, but we shall see. Terry Austin, thank you. Sorry we had to keep this so short. Appreciate Quite it. Quite all right. Thanks. Coming up. <laughs> Officers in the air, on the ground, trying to stop a carjacking suspect as he tries to outrun them, even hitting an officer. We've got this insane infrared and body cam video coming up next. We're on scene tonight with body cam and chopper video from the Baltimore Police Department. Officers were investigating the theft of a Nissan Rogue when they found the vehicle in a parking lot. The suspect, Corey Dixon, was inside. Officers called for backup, including a police helicopter. Then they approached the SUV. Hey, let me see your hands. Hey, do not, do not, do not! He's pulling off, he's pulling off! Dixon sped off, hitting trainee officer Thomas Smith head on with the vehicle. Now, fortunately, Smith was not seriously injured. He opened fire, shooting Dixon in the hand and shoulder, but Dixon kept driving. As he tried to get away from police on the ground, the helicopter pilot kept him in sight. Well, he turns, Fox, he turns. Fox, he just hit an officer. He's headed towards Collington, headed towards Collington. He's going to be going across Mira, westbound Mira, coming up to Chester Street. Still westbound. He's going to be in the parking lot now, 1200 block of Preston Street in the rear. Cutting across, coming up to Preston Street now. He just hit another car. He's going to be bailing out, 1200 block of Preston. I'm sorry. He's going to be westbound towards Washington. Westbound towards Washington. Preston and Washington. Northbound on Washington from Preston. Northbound on Washington. He's going to be in the rear. Uh, it's like 2,000 block of Ellsworth, 2005, coming out to Ellsworth, still crossing the alleyway, coming up to Hoffman Street, Hoffman, 2013 Hoffman. He's going to be cutting across back out to Washington. All right, now he's going to be in the rear of the uh, 2,000 block of Washington. Police found the crashed vehicle and the helicopter pilot continued to guide officers to the suspect's location as he hid at an apartment building. Yeah, 10-4, right in that cut right there. That's where he's going to be, right there. 10-4. He's going to be right on the left-hand side. All right, they're making contact with him now. Dixon surrendered, was taken to the hospital for his injuries. He was charged with second-degree assault. Joining me now, retired LAPD Sergeant Cheryl Dorsey. Sergeant, that is quite a video. Take us through this from an officer's point of view. Well, listen, the problem that I have with the video is that, in my opinion, the officers used poor tactics. 
When you use poor tactics, it will surely get you involved in an officer-involved shooting. They knew that this uh, suspect had been involved in a home invasion robbery, had stolen the victim's vehicle. They were directed to his location. Why would you approach the vehicle and try to open the door and then have another officer position, position himself in front of the vehicle? Well, when you do that, you're likely to get hit, and now you've created an opportunity to use deadly force, something you don't want to do when a suspect is behind the wheel of a vehicle, because when you shoot a driver, there's a very good likelihood that bad things can happen with an incapacitated driver. So it turned out fine, suspect was taken into custody, but this thing could have ended way, way differently. Um, I wanna talk about the chopper pilot and how they're able to track the suspect. This is an enormous advantage for a police department to have a chopper like that, that can continue to follow the suspect. You know, that's one of the things that I was always mindful of whenever I was in a vehicle or foot pursuit is to get an air unit right away, request an air unit, because no one, whether on foot or in a car, can outrun a helicopter. And the pilot up there did an amazing job of directing officers directly to the suspect's location. Again, the problem that I had is that that one officer by himself, without the benefit of backup, encountered the suspect. Again, it could have ended very differently had he been armed and fired on that individual officer. And again, this is an issue we see a lot when it comes to tactics, is this idea of reaching into a car is always, I shouldn't say always, can very often be dangerous for officers. Absolutely, you grab the, the door of a vehicle and there's a driver behind it, expect to be drugged. You've just created a reason now to shoot at somebody and say, well, he was dragging the officer or I thought he was gonna hit me, then don't approach. They had ample officers there to freeze frame and make that situation safe to take him into custody or pursue him should he run. Sergeant Cheryl Dorsey, thank you very much for your perspective. Really appreciate it. Thank you. All right, that does it for us tonight. News Nation Prime starts right now or in five seconds. Thank you for watching. Click the red subscribe button below so you can get more of News Nation's fact driven, unbiased coverage.